Sure. So okay, Calder is back, and he will tell us about brain of actions and PBW type basis. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just to recall, we had like a little 10 minute intro uh, to chapter eight last time. Um, so what we talked about last time was that the goal in this chapter is to sort of formulate and prove an analog of the PBW theorem for UQG. Um, so again, we talked about how this will involve these root vectors, um, analogs of the root vectors in the classical case, because we want um, a basis of ordered monomials in these root vectors um, for U plus. But a priori, we only have uh, root vectors for simple roots, not arbitrary positive roots. So that's the first thing we sort of have to fix before we can even talk about the PBW theorem. And to get these root vectors, um, we're going to define a braid group action on U um, and exploit that to, to sort of construct these, these root vectors corresponding to arbitrary positive roots. So to motivate that, we talked about the fact that in the classical setting, we have these S alpha I tildes, um, which are sort of lifts of, of these um, simple reflections S alpha I. Um, and we talked about what that looks like on SL2, um, and we wanted to find a quantum analog of these um, S alpha I tildes. But I still really haven't told you why this um, will help us. So let's start with that. So, um, so first, I, I've been talking about braid group actions. So I just wanted to define, um, before we continue, uh, the braid group associated to a vowel group. So the braid group. associated to a vowel group W is the group generated by these simple reflections S alpha I for alpha I simple roots, but modulo only the braid relations in the vowel group. And these relations are um, if S alpha I, S alpha J has order M in W, then we impose the relation like this where there are M terms on this side and M terms on this side. And so what we're omitting is the relations uh, S alpha I squared equals one. So it's a fact that, um, so when I talk about reduced expressions, I'm talking about expressions which are minimal length in terms of these simple reflections. So if we pick some element of the vowel group W, so for W and W, any two reduced expressions are related by braid relations. So if we accept the fact that um, these S alpha I tilde satisfy the braid relations, then for any um, W in the vowel group, we can define W tilde as such for a reduced expression for W. And this is going to be well defined because, um, as I said, any two reduced expressions are related by these braid relations, and the S alpha I tilde themselves satisfy the braid relations. So then, for any positive root, we can, I could say define or, or even find if we've defined them else in another way. So one way to define the, the root vector E beta in UN plus is to set E beta equals W tilde E alpha, where W alpha equals beta. 
for alpha, a simple root. And you know, w. So again, we can write this in terms of these s of i tilde. So here I've just shown you that if we accept the existence of the you know, simple root vectors, then we can find all the root vectors corresponding to positive roots by the spray group action. So this you know, philosophy is kind of silly in the classical case because we already know how to define the positive root vectors, but it's going to be useful in the quantum case because we're going to define all of these um, positive root vectors by uh, using the Bray group action, which I'm about to explain. So yeah, if I can. Yeah, just a comment. I mean, you write e beta, but in your definition, uh, a priori, it depends on the choice of uh, alpha and w. Dep there's a small, a priori, a small dependence, OK? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, OK. And so later, I'll explain how there's sort of also different choices in the quantum case, but we're going to pick one, and it's going to be uh, a consistent choice. And so it's going to work out. Uh, so yeah, so the goal from now on is to find to, to follow this outline in the quantum setting. We're going to construct a break group action on U and all, all, and all finite dimensional U modules, um, analogous to the one we just defined here. And then we'll define these E betas in the quantum case. So let's define this action I've been talking about in the SL2 case. So again, we're, we're going to start by restricting ourselves to g equals SL2. And we'll write you know, e equals e alpha, just for ease of notation, and q equals q alpha. And we're going to continue to discuss, as in previous talks, um, finite dimensional type 1 U modules. So for any such V in the SL2 case, we have that V is the direct sum over integers M of its M weight spaces, where this VM is the set of all V such that K acts by the Mth power of Q on V. And just some more notation we'll need is this divided power notation, which we're going to use a lot going forward. So additionally, recall we had this automorphism omega of u with omega of e equals f, omega of f equals e, and omega of k equals k inverse. So now we're going to define four linear operators. Um, so for some integer and some vector in the mth weight space, we're going to define four linear operators acting on this vector as follows. So if you bear with me now while I'm writing all these out, I can copy and paste them for the general case. <laughs> so this, this will be a one-time ordeal of writing out all these actions. Right. And the uh, way how, you know, how this comes to be is that this is a new deformation for the formulas that we had in the, for the usual reflection. So when q is equal to one, then you get this product of exponentials, which really represents uh, the matrix zero, one, minus one, zero. 
Yeah. And uh, there, there is an art of, uh, you know, putting correct powers of Q everywhere. And it's so, so there is a notion of, there is a notion of Q exponential. And you can write that in terms of those. Right, but in Q exponential, you also need to put powers of Q. That's right. Somewhere. That's the only thing you need to do. And then this is actually a product of Q exponentials. So this is Maybe not a long deal, it's actually fun. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> and I mean, there's a way to, to write it, uh, Lucic has uh, used that uh, as a sum with only a power of E and a power of F or a power of F and a power of E. So you can rewrite the triple product as a, as a double product uh, Lucic uses as a formula for that. Uh, that's a fairly special one. I see, okay. This is, and this is useful uh, when you look at the clarification. Uh, this was this was observed by Lustig earlier, but that's what we end up uh, we ended up using. It, yeah, but the formula itself was uh, uh, predates uh, the categorification. So, so can you say again? So, what the formula? What sort of formula this is? Well, you can write uh, down uh, um, as uh, Pavel was mentioning. I mean, when you look at categorical actions, uh, you can write the action uh, using only a, a power of e times the power of f. Or the other way around. Okay, you don't need the triple a triple product. And if you write down the formula in the quantum group, uh, that tells you when you act on a vector of a given weight, uh, uh, the action can be written uh, using only uh, uh, a, a simple sum that involves only a one a power of e times the power of s. And that's something that's in one of the early papers of uh, Lustig. Uh, this exact formula. So this is an a priori infinite sum, but it's finite on every right. It's a finite sum and it involves that you can many terms cancel there. Somehow you have a you have a double sum, okay? There's that it's there are two indices, I mean it depends on two indices, and you can write it as a sum depending on only one index, and you only have to move in the string you start from a weight, and you only have to move uh, uh, you only move uh, down. You move down, 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 down all the way to uh, uh, to the some of the to the lowest weight. And then up, up, up uh, to the to the more the opposite weight. You only have to do that. Uh, so the sum is uh, depends on the distance from your weight uh, to the lowest weight uh, right. in the six formula. So the formula depends on the weight. The formula depends on the weight. It's a sum, and the number of terms in the formula depends on uh, on the um, how far on the weight how far you are to the lowest weight yeah. for near reducible representation. Right. And so, and this Q exponential, so. Is there one or two most important properties that we need to know? Well, <clears throat> yeah, they, they, uh, they satisfy the rule exponential of x plus y equal exponential of x times exponential of y, but only uh, for the q commuting variables x and y. Everything basically comes from that. And actually, this function is determined by this property. Okay, and Roma gets an exercise of writing it down. Okay. Uh -huh. And meanwhile, maybe Carl can continue with his talk. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, um, so I'll just note that, you know, we have these four sort of variants, but these um, here come uh, from twisting the first two by this automorphism omega I just talked about. Um, and also maybe you want to keep in mind that we're going to prove later that um, T prime is going to be the inverse of omega T and omega t prime, uh, the inverse of t. So these are all going to be useful when we're talking about bijectivity and things. So recall the uh, module ln plus, this irreducible highest weight module of type 1 of weight n for um, UQSL2. So what we want to do now is determine the action of the operators I just mentioned on uh, this module. So let's let v naught be the highest weight vector of v. And recall that we have this nice basis um, And we have a nice way of acting on this basis. So,
And then, you know, if these formulas are to be true, then we should set vj equals zero for j less than zero or j greater than n. Okay, so now we're going to describe the action of our operators on this basis um, using the following property of uh, Gaussian binomial coefficients. So this is going to be a lemma. So maybe if you set q equal to one, this, this might be more familiar, um, this combinatorial identity. Um, but the proof for q not equal to one, I'll leave to you. It's an exercise um, in binomial coefficients. And the main applications are going to start here. So we have the next lemma, which is that for all i, we understand the action of t and its variance on these basis vectors vi. So it's going to act as follows. So this is also going to be an exercise um, so I'll say exercise with Gaussian binomial coefficients. OK, so the main point of this is that the operators t omega t, t prime, omega t prime are bijective on each finite dimensional type 1 UQ SL2 module. And we have the following relations. So as I said, we have these inverse relations. And further, We have that for all integers and vectors with that weight, we can relate the twist, the omega twisted um, variant of t to t itself. So the proof of this is that by complete reducibility, it suffices to just prove it for um, v equal ln plus, because again, we're just dealing with finite dimensional type one modules. Um, so we can check one and two on, oh, sorry. So, so bijectivity first is by lemma 8.3. So here, we know that basis vectors get sent to other basis vectors, and these coefficients are invertible. Um, and then we can check these relations one and two on the basis vi. And then these two follow from 8.3, because we know explicitly the action on these basis vectors. So we can just check these relations. So I'll leave the, the precise check to you, but this is how it's proved. So what, we've, what we're working towards here is this result, which is that not only do we understand the action on the basis vectors, but we understand the relationship between t and the algebra generators. So for v as above, and uh, v and v, 
we have the following relations. So I'll just sketch a proof of this. So again, um, it's enough to take V equals N L N plus for the same reason. And uh, V equals V I for some I. So, because if we check on the basis, then that's enough. So let's just do the first one. So let's just prove this first relation to just get a taste of what's going on. So we can compute explicitly TE of VI. We know what E of VI is. It's just N plus one minus I times VI minus one. And then we know how T acts on this basis vector. So we can write this down explicitly. So let's compare this now to ft of vi. This is going to be f of the expression for t of vi, which we had before. And again, we know how f acts. So We end with this. So comparing these two and their coefficients tells us that T of E of V I is equal to negative Q of two I minus N times F T of V. E. But then this is just what we want. So again, we're trying to prove this. This is gonna be exactly what we get. And then this line is because Vn minus i has weight to i minus n. So we know how k acts. And so similar proofs for, for the rest of these relations up here. OK, so in SL2, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on. We know how it acts on the basis. We know how it relates to the generators of the algebra. So let's talk about the general case. And maybe an exercise uh, is that uh, for e action of each of this atomorphism, there is a compatible atomorphism of the algebra, which is kind of, which in the case of uh, SL2 can be just verified by hand. Namely, you just check that the formulas in uh, Calder's uh, lemma. Uh, this, this give you formulas on generators. Uh, for example, E goes to minus FK and so on. So this, for, this formula is defined in algebra atomorphism. Right, yeah, and th this is gonna be really important. I'm gonna talk about this explicitly in the general case because ultimately the, one of the main reasons we want all these formulas is uh, to understand that exact action on the, uh, on the algebra itself. So, okay, let's return now to U equals UQ of G for general G. Um, so let's extend all our definitions in the, the natural way. So the divided power notations is also going to extend. Um, so let V be a finite dimensional type one UQG module. And then we're going to define the, the uh, you know, operators in the general case such that for all um, lambda await and V in the weight space,
we're going to have these same things, but with alphas everywhere. Okay, so, but here, remember last time M was an integer, which was the weight of V. So that's not exactly the same setup here. So here we have M is the pairing with of uh, lambda and alpha check, which is just this quantity. And recall from previous lectures that we use the notation Q of alpha is Q of alpha alpha over two. So, okay, in order to say things about how these operators act and their relationship to algebra generators, um, we're gonna use a standard sort of trick. So recall, we have this embedding for any alpha, UQ alpha of SL2 into UQG, defined by E maps to E alpha, F maps to F alpha and K maps to K alpha. So considering F, uh, V as a UQ alpha SL2 module, we get exactly the T from earlier. And the proof of this is just the fact that I copy and pasted the same thing and put alphas. <laughs> so uh, this means that many of the results we prove for T in the SL2 case lift straight away to give um, the same sorts of results for general T alpha. So here are the properties we get immediately. We get the following. We get that T alpha and T alpha prime are bijective with inverses omega t alpha prime and omega t alpha. We also get that omega t alpha v is the same sort of expression in terms of t alpha v and same for the prime version. Then this is important. So we have that T alpha takes the lambda weight space of V, and maps it isomorphically to the S alpha lambda weight space. And the same for, I'll just say same for variance. The you know the omega twisted version than the prime version. So I'll what are you what nowadays? Variant. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't use that word. Um, <laughs> so, so we'll leave this as a as an exercise. But this is not so hard to to see. It's a couple of lines, and uh, and lemma eight point five from before. Um, that was eight point five was the relationship between the generators and T alpha. Um, so this implies that we have the exact same relations, but we put alphas everywhere. So I won't write them all out again, but the same relations hold with alphas. So if finally, if beta um, is another simple root and we have that the inner product of alpha and beta is zero, then we know already that E beta commutes with E alpha and with F alpha. And that means it commutes with T alpha, because again, we define T alpha in terms of these E alpha and F alpha. So um, E beta T alpha is T alpha E beta V 
and the same for f. Okay, so now we're going to need to know some more relations for these t alpha. So to motivate this, um, as Yvonne said already, going back to the classical case, we didn't just have um, these S alpha tilde automorphisms on um, finite dimensional G modules only, they, they are also an uh, automorphism of G itself. Um, and they satisfy this sort of compatibility So we want similar behavior from our T alpha. We want to define an action on the actual algebra U. Um, and for this, we'll need a bunch of formulas, but I'll give you the, the sort of end goal first. Uh, before we get formulas, uh, I want to ask a question uh, aimed at the audience. The question is this. So, you know, um, why do we need to take the Spains when uh, actually uh, the quantized universal enveloping algebra is a module over itself, right? So there is a joint action. So why don't we define uh, T alphas on the universal enveloping algebra on this quantized uh, algebra just by means of the joint action? Does anybody in the audience want to answer this? But when you say a joint, you mean conjugation or hope for joint? Well, I mean, there is only one adjoint action, right? Which is hope for joint action. Otherwise, I don't know how to conjugate, right? Well, if there's an invertible element, you can multiply by. Well, I mean, you don't have an element yet, right? There's just some infinite sum, so it doesn't give us an element. No, to be compatible, we cannot conjugate. Uh, okay, this is an element that acts in every finite dimensional representation, but uh, if we just conjugate by it, it will not be compatible with the uh, with the action on the representation because it's a quantum uh, group. It's not a enveloping algebra. The coproduct is not not coproduct of this element is not equal to its tensor square. Okay, that's one of the versions of the answer. So I somehow didn't regard Pasha as a member of the audience. No, I didn't. Uh, I was answering Roma's question, not your question. I think I'm not allowed to answer your question, right? That's right. But but I think this question is too complicated. I think you should give us a, some hints. Uh, well, I can give the answer. Well, I mean, there is one, um, one. so first of all, uh, okay, so maybe I should answer my own question. At least I'm allowed to do that. So the answer is twofold. So answer number one is that uh, the joint representation is not, uh, uh, a joint representation is not locally finite. So it's not true that every element of the universal of the quantized universal enveloping algebra is contained in a finite dimensional sub-representation. And that's actually a pretty important fact, which uh, the audience members are encouraged to verify in the case of UQSL2. But even on, uh, where, so this uh, yet to be atomorphism is not going to be defined to all elements. Well, that's one issue. But even if you ignore this issue, uh, what you get is not going to be an algebra tomorphism. So there is no reason for the quantized adjoint action just to be by algebra tomo uh, automorphisms. So these are uh, two reasons why we need to do this additional work. And Roma, uh, 
suggested that we should give answer and hints for understanding it. Uh, well, maybe not. That's okay. okay. Maybe Calder can continue. Sure, yeah. So, um, so I was saying that we want this algebra automorphism. We want it to be compatible with the automorphisms we've already defined on finite dimensional type one U modules. Um, so we're going to need a lot of formulas, but what I'm doing here is I'm giving you the, the sort of goal. Um, so what we're going to prove is that for all U and U, there is a unique U prime in U such that T alpha of uv is u prime t alpha v again for all v in v finite dimensional type one and the map u maps to u prime is an automorphism So just to keep in mind going forward when we're talking about all these sort of formulas. Um, uh, Calder, yeah. perhaps you can say that it's an algebra automorphism. Right. Because in U, you have a whole bunch of structures and uh, it's not an automorphism for all of them. Right, algebra automorphism. So, um, yeah, so, so, keep, so keep this in mind when we go through sort of the formulas we're about to unpack because um, we would like to prove that it's bijective. That's sort of the first step. Um, and to do so, we need to understand which U prime can appear here and also what happens um, to the U prime, which uh, what happens to the U here, which are the generators of our algebra. So that's sort of going to be the motivation for these formulas. So in particular, it will be useful to have formulas for um, e beta t alpha v for alpha not equal to beta, t alpha e beta v, and similarly for e beta replaced by f beta. So again, recall from earlier that we, we know formulas for these when beta is equal to alpha. We also know formulas when alpha and beta have inner product zero, but there's lots of cases in between that we still need to study. So here's sort of a key computation. Uh, actually, uh, can I make a comment? Yeah. 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 So, so I think I, I, I said something wrong. So, so I, I I think Ro Roma is correct that uh, uh, the, you can define X. So this element lies in uh, pro-finite uh, dimensional completion of the quantum group. And so uh, you can define uh, the action uh, just by conjugating by this element. But it's not obvious why it maps uh, elements of the algebra itself to, it, to, them, to elements of the algebra. And so uh, basically we will uh, uh, use a slightly different approach. What happens at roots of unity is that this action becomes truly outer action. So uh, no, there is no longer any uh, inner uh, atomorphisms. Okay, cool, thank you. So, yeah, so this key computation is going to be for alpha and beta simple roots. Um, we're going to define R to be their negative pairing. And for all finite dimensional type 1 U modules, V and all V and V, we're going to have this formula, which I'm going to call star. So this is going to tell us 
if we're keeping this in mind, this proposition we're aiming towards, this is going to tell us where u maps. Um, so what the u prime is when, when we set u equal to e beta. And the, the corresponding u prime is going to be this element here. So setting q equal to 1, you might recognize this formula in, in terms of this s alpha tildes, as long as you have the correct signs. But um, let's sketch the proof. So. So this is a big computation, but here are sort of the key steps. So for m greater than or equal to 0, we have the formula add e alpha m on e beta Is this big sum? So this comes from the formula for um, add of e alpha to the m, which we saw in Leonardo's lecture. Um, but then just using divided powers, we get this formula. And uh, and actually, it might be it might be a little common. So uh, this formula is sort of completely uh, expectable. And just note that uh, when q is equal to 1, we get this formula absolutely for free. Because for q equal to 1, the t alpha just must send uh, uh, e, So e beta is a lowest weight uh, vector. And so t alpha just sends e beta to uh, this expression. Right. So. You know, once we have this formula, we're going to use it to prove um, that for, so I'll say use this to prove that for m and i greater than or equal to 0, we have this formula. So we can multiply on the right. We get this sum. So, so and e uh, divided by power i minus j is in fact e alpha, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, we also have an analogous formula um, for the f's. So I'll call this formula two. Um, so this is done by uh, induction on i using the previous formula. Um, so once we have these, um, we're going to let a of m be this quantity on the right, which we want. So finally, we're going to use these formulas one and two to get a formula for A of R T alpha V, which is, again, the right-hand side of our goal. So indeed, um, T alpha V is a linear combination 
of terms of the form uh, E alpha A, F alpha B, E alpha C times V. And so applying one, then two, then one again, allows us to pass these ARs uh, past each of these terms. Um, so what we end up with is a linear combination of terms of the form E alpha A, F alpha B, E alpha C of A of R minus H of V, once we actually enact this, where um, if we define S to be this pairing, then H is S plus A minus B plus C. So simplifying the coefficients on such terms, we see that the coefficients are zero if, uh, so unless h is equal to r. So all of these terms vanish unless, unless they're a zero terms. And so what we end up with is a formula for a r of t alpha v. But then since A0 is just E beta itself, because remember, um, this is how we defined A of M. So since A0 is E beta, we have that A0 of V is just in this weight space, lambda minus beta. Um, and lambda minus beta paired with alpha check is S minus R by definition of S and R. Um, and so we can recognize this is a formula for um, T alpha of E beta of V. Because we're summing and S minus R is the exact weight that um, is written in the definition of T alpha. So, we have this result. Um, so remember what we actually get here. We get a formula for T alpha E beta V. Um, we would also like a formula for T alpha uh, F beta of V. Um, but rather than going through all this again, we have we can use the following result. So um, so if we have U and U prime in U such that T alpha of UV is U prime T alpha V for all V in finite dimensional U modules V, then we can understand the omega twisted situation as such. And further, if uh, u is in the mu graded part of u for u in the root lattice, um, then T alpha of omega u v is equal to negative Q alpha to this power times omega u prime T alpha v for all such v. So the proof of this is um, 
an exercise, but the first claim is easy. Second follows from the first and the formulas from before, which relate um, omega t alpha v and t alpha of v for v in the lambda of space. OK, so once we have this, this way of twisting the situation by omega, um, we can just say that applying this to star, this formula we worked hard to prove, um, gives us an analogous formula for f beta. Well, I guess at this point, uh, t alpha f beta should be applied to some vector, right? That's right. OK. So now, we want to deduce from this a formula for um, E beta T alpha V. So now we understand what happens when we have this sort of U from, the, from this proposition above on the inside. But we would like to see um, if we can write down an expression for this, um, which, which in this automorphism picture, um, which I stated here as motivation, we want to exhibit E beta um, as the image of some U rather than just plugging in a u and seeing to which u prime it goes. So we'd like a formula for this. Um, so we can do this by twisting by the, or sorry, twisting the adjoint action. So recall the uh, anti-automorphism tau, which was defined in the previous lecture by uh, tau of E alpha equals E alpha, tau of F alpha equals F alpha, and tau of K alpha equals K alpha inverse. So for all x and u, we define the tau twist of add x from u to u by tau add x equals tau composed with add x, composed with add, composed with tau. And tau is an anti-automorphism. But then this twist is still an action. So this leads us to this claim. 8.12. Um, so with R as before, we now have. And as a formula above, uh, R should be R of X, right? That's right. Thank you. I guess I should use this. <laughs> OK, so. Using this trick and twisting by this anti-automorphism, um, we get a sort of similar formula, but reversed. And uh, in particular, if m is equal to r, we get the formula e beta of t alpha v is t alpha of this element. Okay. 
So we, we end up getting the formula which motivated this. Okay, so um, maybe we should take a break before I sketch the proof or what do you think Yvonne? Uh, yes, let's uh, take a 10 minute break. Sounds good. Does uh, anybody have questions? Well, is there a is there a nice description of T alpha on tensor products of finite dimensional modules? Yeah, yes, there, there is a formula for. Also, there is a formula. So, so we had this element, which uh, we wrote by this sum over three indices. So there is a formula for its co-product. It's not group-like, but it uh, it failure to be group-like is expressed by R matrix for SL two. So, so the, the, there is a nice formula, and this formula actually can be used to find the explicit formula for the R matrix. How does it help to, oh, I think. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. So to, to get the R matrix, you have to consider not T alpha, but the T corresponding. So we will show that this T alpha satisfy braid relations. And therefore to every element of uh, the Weil group, you can attach a corresponding T because uh, you just take reduced decomposition. And then if you take T corresponding to maximal Y group element, this T, uh, if you, it's failure to be group-like is exactly the R matrix. And, and using the fact that this T is a product of simple reflections, you can write a product formula for the R matrix. Hmm. So I hope this does not spoil the talk, but does that mean that the induced map on, on U is not only an, algeb an algebra morphism? Well, it's an algebra automorphism, but it's what is called a tw twisted automorphism. Uh, twisted Hopf algebra automorphism. Twisted Hopf algebra. So, so this means that it changes the co-product but it changes it by a Greenfield twist. So this means that it does define a tensor, it defines the out equivalence of tensor category. Even though it does not preserve the co-product. Hmm. Wow, okay, thank you. Will we explore more about this? That, like how it twists the co-algebra structure? So Vanya, what is the plan? Is the plan? Uh... Uh, no, we will, we will not. Okay. So we will finish with uh, Janssen's book uh, in Calder's talk. Uh, was it going to be this time or the next time? And then we'll venture into quantum groups at uh, Roots of Unity. Mm. Okay. Thank you. But actually, this story with twisted automorphisms is even more interesting in Roots of Unity. Well, Pasha, this is not to do interesting stuff, right? It's to do boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you provide a perfect explanation of why we are not going to cover this. <laughs> Okay, let me pause the recording. All right, maybe we should uh, try to resume.
Sounds good. So, um, so yeah, we have this claim. Um, so let's just sketch a proof before we move on to um, talking about this algebra automorphism that we're all leading towards. So, so here are sort of the main steps of uh, deducing the above. So first, we can see that um, the tau adjoint action of uh, E alpha on some element U is U E alpha minus E alpha K alpha U K alpha inverse. We have a similar formula for F alpha. And for k alpha. Okay, so next we claim that if uh, t alpha of uv equals u prime of t alpha v for all v in finite dimensional u modules v. Then we know how to apply T alpha um, to this element. We know what comes out as our U prime. Um, and similarly for the F alpha. So let's just do the first one. So we have um, that the left-hand side is equal to T alpha of this by our formula above here. And then we can use our formulas for T alpha, E alpha, um, to pull out this negative F alpha, K alpha term. Um, and similarly for the other side. Um, we can simplify this. And we get what we want. So combining this observation, this claim here, with uh, this formula star, which we had way up here. So recall this formula. This tells us how to apply T alpha to E beta. Um, so combining all that with star, um, this is just going to give us sort of tau twist, which uh, we want. So, okay, I'll leave it at that. So now that we have this, we have all these um, formulas in hand, let's move on and, and try to achieve our goal of using these relations to show um, how to compute the action of T um, on generators and, and show this that it's an algebra automorphism as we hinted at earlier. So um, that was expressed here. So 
So let's prove this. So suppose that U1 and U2 are in U. And suppose that we've already found U1 prime and U2 prime. Then we can take U1, U2 prime equals U1 prime, U2 prime. And A U1 plus B U2 prime equals A U1 prime plus B U2 prime. Um, and this, this will still be satisfied. So it suffices to show existence just for the generators of U. And that's exactly what we've been doing. So um, observe that we know that T alpha of K mu V equals K S alpha U T alpha V. So we have these formulas, these more basic observations from earlier, which begun in the SL2 case, and were sort of upgraded. So I'll say basic from before. And then we have these key computations when alpha is not equal to beta. So this was star. So this, these were the key computations um, above. So, OK, so we have existence now. Um, we know that for each generator, there exists some object you can pull to the left side of the T alpha, um, and we have the correct relation. So for uniqueness, if u prime and u prime prime both satisfy the condition for a given u, then we have u prime minus u prime prime of t alpha of v is you know t alpha of uv minus t alpha of uv, which is zero for all v in all finite dimensional modules. And since T type alpha, one. type one, yes. <laughs> since T alpha is bijective, this means um, U prime minus U prime prime annihilates every finite dimensional type one U module. So u prime minus u prime prime equals 0 by what we saw in Leonardo's lecture. So by definition, so we have existence and uniqueness here. Um, but so by this definition, it's an algebra uh, endomorphism. Because we've defined it on generators and, and then just said, you know, define it on every other algebra element accordingly. But note, we've already shown surjectivity of the map U maps to U prime, because we have formulas for Uh, K mu T alpha V, E alpha T alpha V, and F alpha T alpha V. These were sort of the easier ones. And then E beta T alpha V and F beta 
t alpha v. So all our generators appear in the image of, of this map. So finally, for injectivity, if u is in the kernel, so I'll just say if u gets sent to 0 under this map, um, then t alpha of uv equals 0, by definition, for all v and all v. Um, but then since t alpha is bijective, again, the same result from Leonardo's lecture says that u equals 0. So u maps to u prime is an automorphism. OK, great. So from now on, by abusive notation, we're going to denote this action uh, u maps to u prime by t alpha itself from u to u. So when we apply t alpha to an element of u, this is the notation we're going to use. Um, so by definition, we have this sort of compatibility formula, which was motivated by the classical case. You know, for v in finite dimensional type one modules. Okay, so let's just collect our formulas from before. Actually, no, I, I'm not going to write it out again. So yeah, so we have um, we've proven it's an automorphism, and we've proven this compatibility, which we wanted. Okay, so now let's talk about braid relations. Because I claimed at the very beginning that what we were going to define was going to be an action of the braid group. And right now, all we have is individual algebra automorphisms um, for each alpha a simple root. So, may I ask a stupid question? Yeah. So, uh... So if I have an auto equivalence on the category of finite dimensional type one modules, can I expect that I always have an algebra equivalence on U? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Like, but if, as Ivan, um, as he suggested that U is infinite dimensional and there are a lot of finite dimensional modules missing in it. Yeah. Why true. should I expect such reconstruction mm -hmm. to hold only from the type one finite dimensional modules? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think the same sort of formulas will hold in the in the non-type one type. I just think they'll be a more complicated. Um, so I think that we could do exactly what we did here, um, but we just restrict it to the the type one case for ease of the proofs. But I'm not sure. Does anyone have anything better to say about this? Well, type one is actually not bothering me. What bothers me is is the finite dimensionality because it. Huh. It seems that the finite dimensional modules are just some special modules of U. And just knowing about finite dimensional modules uh, misses lots of information about U. But here it seems that it suggests if we have an auto equivalence on the finite dimensional modules, then there would be a automorphisms on U. Well, it doesn't mean that much. So, uh, for example, as was mentioned, uh, the joint action on U, uh, well, it's not locally finite, there is still a very large subalgebra, which is uh, where it will be locally finite. 
So, uh, I, I think finding the mushroom modules are sufficient for our purposes. And then, you know, if you just have some collection of operators, mm -hmm. that, that say functorial in certain sense, and you want to understand whether it leads to homomorphism, well, you still will need to check something. I mean, the category of finite dimensional representations is stable, is stable under this braid group action, but the category O, for example, is not, because the braid group action changes polarization. But if you take a pure braid group, we act on category O. So elements of pure braid group can be written in such a way that we have defined in category O. Okay, so um, so yeah, I was going to say that these um, these T alpha we define should satisfy the braid relations because ultimately we want an action of the braid group. So Lustig showed that um, the T alpha on both modules and the algebra automorphism we just defined they do satisfy the braid relations. Um, so again, I'll say what that means here. So for uh, alpha beta simple root with alpha not equal to beta, if S alpha S beta has order M in the vial group, then T alpha T beta, T beta T alpha and so on for M terms here and M terms here. So again, this generalizes the behavior of these S alpha tilde. So the proof in general requires long calculations, but we'll do it for um, m equals three to give an idea of the proof. Um, m equals two is an exercise. And it's an easy exercise just using the fact that in, in the case of m equals two, everything commutes. So, And m equals six, which is a case of g2 is a sweet little piece uh which can be found in Janssen's book right exactly <laughs> so okay so when s alpha s beta has order three is when these pairings are negative one and the lengths are the same. So um, Q alpha is Q beta. So our formulas from earlier, so let's let's just write Q for Q alpha and Q beta for convenience. Um, our formulas for earlier give us that T alpha V beta is E alpha E beta minus Q inverse, E beta, E alpha. So this is just using the formulas, um, the explicit formulas for U prime in terms of U in the language of the theorem about algebra automorphism. Um, but then just plugging in m equals um, three. So we'll call these together, we'll call this equation three. So um, let's state a lemma. So let alpha and beta 
these simple roots such that s alpha s beta is of order three, then what the braid relation says is that we should have t alpha t beta t alpha as t beta t alpha t beta as automorphisms, as algebra automorphisms of u. Um, so the proof, it's enough, again, to check that the two sides coincide on generators of u. Um, and it's an easy exercise to show it on, so on u naught. So it remains just to look at um, E gamma, F gamma for gamma simple. These are the remaining generators. Um, so for if gamma equals alpha or beta, we can just check both sides. So for example, for E beta, what we would get is just by the above formulas, um, we have T alpha of E beta is T beta inverse of E alpha. So we substitute that in. Um, then this just gives us T alpha of E alpha. And this is negative F alpha K alpha, as we've seen before. Um, and then we can just check the other side. So again, we can just explicitly check that we get the same thing on both sides. And then similarly, you can check for F beta and, and so on. And, and you can replace beta with alpha and the same trick works. So, okay, so we've looked at these generators when gamma is alpha or beta. So now we assume that gamma is not equal to alpha or beta. So since the Dinkin diagram contains no loops, this implies that um, either this pairing is zero or this pairing is zero. And then so without loss of generality, let's just assume it's the pairing with beta. Check. So this means that E gamma and E beta commute because this pairing is zero. And same with f beta. How um, this implies that t beta of e gamma is just e gamma itself. So then applying t beta t alpha to this formula, we get from the series of formulas I wrote above which I called three, um, that uh, this commutator is also zero. And this implies that T alpha T beta T alpha E gamma. It's just T beta T alpha E gamma. And so T alpha T beta T alpha E gamma is equal to T beta T alpha E gamma is equal to T beta T alpha T beta E gamma. And Similarly for F gamma. So that's the proof for M equals three. So again, we're just writing everything down in terms of these formulas and we have this nice symmetry. Um, and we use this to conclude.
So recall that the Val group is generally- Do I understand correctly is that uh, when M is bigger than three, then you actually need to work pretty hard. Yes, that is true, <laughs> which is why I'm not working hard. <laughs> so, uh, but Janssen works hard and you're, you're welcome to look at his hard work in his book. So um, recall that these Val group, uh, that the Val group is generated by these, these uh, simple reflections S alpha. And as I said before, reduced expressions for any Val group element are related by braid relations and they remain reduced after applying braid relations. So since um, the T alpha satisfy braid relations, um, we can define for any W and W, TW, the composition of the corresponding T alpha I for a choice of reduced expression for W. And this is well-defined what by what I just said. And so further, because if uh, the length of WW prime so if we have that the lengths are additive on W and W prime, we get that we can just concatenate the uh, expressions. And so this gives us this formula, concatenate the reduced expressions. So um, it is clear that um, T, TW of K mu is K W of mu, because we already know this for each simple um, t, t alpha for alpha, a simple root. Um, and similarly, Tw of the mu graded part of u is just the w mu graded part of u. Okay, so we're very close now to using this braid group action to defining group vectors, which was the ultimate goal. And we're gonna need to state the PBW type theorem for you. So let's do that now. So, from now on, let's just restrict to the simply lace case. So um, let's just assume that M is equal to two or three for simplicity. And we have the following proposition. So if we have a simple root and a Val group element, then if W applied to the simple root is positive, then TW applied to the corresponding simple root vector, which we have by the definition of U, is still in the positive part of U. And if um, W alpha is simple itself, then TW of E alpha is going to be EW alpha, which is defined already because again, it's already, it's assumed to be simple. So we obviously need this if we're going to, um, if we're going to use these TWs to construct root vectors in the same way that I hinted at with the classical setup. So to prove this, so we're going to go by induction on the length of the file group element. So if the length is positive, then 
we can pick beta um, not equal to alpha such that w of beta is negative by the you know by one definition of, of the length. So there exists w prime w prime prime such that w can be written as their product with w prime prime uh, in the subgroup generated by s alpha and s, s beta um, such that w prime of beta is greater than or equal to zero, w prime of alpha is greater than zero. And uh, LW is going to be the sum of the lengths. So we're, we're really just decomposing our um, vial group element into the part which begins with these S alphas and S betas and the part um, in the remaining part. Um, so W prime prime is not equal to one implies um, that the length of W prime is actually smaller. So after we've decomposed like this by induction, get you know we get for example um, T W prime of E alpha is in the positive part by our induction hypothesis. And same with uh, E beta. So we'll call these formulas four. Um, and then we have to deal with this remaining W prime prime part. We'll, we'll deal with this as follows. So here's the lemma. Um, so under the above assumptions on W prime prime, T W prime prime of E alpha is contained in the subalgebra generated by E alpha and E beta. And if W prime prime is simple, um, then sorry, I don't mean this. I mean W prime prime of alpha is simple. Then T W prime prime of E alpha is E. W alpha. So the proof. And this is really a uh, rank two case of the previous lemma. Right. And by yeah. the way, in the last line, uh, W alpha subscript should be W double right. prime alpha. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So since So since m equals two or three, it's easy. Um, if m equals two, w prime prime is just s beta. So in that case, uh, t w e alpha is just going to be e alpha itself by you know what we know for m equals two. And, and similarly, we've already worked out the sort of relations for m equals three. So when m equals three, we know that w prime prime is either s beta or it's s alpha s beta. So in that case, tw of e alpha is going to be either by the relations we worked out before, e beta e alpha minus q alpha inverse e alpha e beta or e beta itself. So from this, we know that T prime prime of E alpha is in the positive part. So 
we're done since uh, I've already told you that TW equals TW prime, TW prime prime. And so if we just apply this fact four, which is that these both lie in the positive part. So we're done. For the second claim, assume that W of alpha is simple. If we show that W prime prime of alpha is simple, we're done by induction applied to W prime and uh, W prime prime of alpha. Um, and so then this is an exercise about root systems. is to show that W prime prime of alpha is simple under the hypotheses above. So once we know that, then we know the second claim um, here, which is that we just get the simple root vector um, that we already knew how to define. So now we're ready to find these positive root vectors in general. So here would be the naive approach. It would be to say for any gamma positive root, pick beta a simple root and W in the vowel group such that W of beta equals gamma, then define E gamma equals TW of E beta. But the problem is that this doesn't actually provide a consistent choice. So this is the example I, I think I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's talk about it. So for example, if phi is of type A2, and so the simple roots are just alpha and beta, and we take gamma equal alpha plus beta, then we could easily write gamma equals S alpha applied to beta, but also S beta applied to alpha, but the problem with this is that um, T alpha applied to E beta, we've seen is just E alpha E beta minus Q inverse E beta E alpha. And we can do the same thing in reverse, but there's some asymmetry here. So these are two linearly independent vectors. So this naive approach doesn't work. Just choosing some vowel group element, which takes your positive root to a simple root, and then just doing the thing corresponding to that simple root um, can give you different answers. But luckily, there's a way to fix this. So luckily, there's still a way to, to make a consistent choice of root vectors. Um, but what we have to do is we first have to make a choice. So I'll say first we must make a choice of reduced expression for the longest element, W naught in the vowel group. So if we choose, W not equal S alpha one through S alpha T reduced, then 
alpha one s alpha one of alpha two s sorry s alpha one s alpha two of alpha three and so on all the way through is a list of positive roots in our root system. Um, this is just sort of a general fact, which you should check. So for gamma positive root, we're going to let i be such that s alpha 1 through s, sorry, multiplying. Well, maybe a comment is in order. So uh, you, it's easy to check that all roots that you get are positive. Yeah. And then uh, the number is precisely the total number of positive roots. Right. So each positive root occurs exactly once. Right. Right. So um, for any gamma positive root, if we let i um, be the choice of i such that that positive root is exhibited in this way, um, because as Yvonne just said, all of the positive roots must appear just by counting. Um, and we define x gamma to be t alpha 1 through t alpha i minus 1. So the corresponding t's um, applied to e alpha i, the corresponding simple root vector. Then this is going to be. Um, what we call the root vector associated to the positive root gamma. Okay, so once we choose a reduced expression for w naught, then we only have one way that we're telling, um, you know, we're, we're, we're describing exactly one way to describe a vector corresponding to each positive root. So this is going to be consistent. And finally, this is going to um, help us prove the PBW type theorem we sought. So this is going to be the right framework in which to state what's going on. So let's state that here. So the theorem So let's recall again that Q is not a root of unity, just to be clear about what I'm what I'm stating here. So with the above setup, we have uh, T alpha one, T alpha two, through T alpha T minus one. Remember, T is the length of the longest element. Um, so again, this is a root vector, as we as we defined it above. And we're going to take ordered monomials in these root vectors as we've just defined them above. So the AI are non negative integers, are a basis for. U plus. So again, it's ordered monomials in the root vectors in the sense that we just defined the root vectors above. And so for each choice of um, reduced expression for the longest element, we get a different ordering. Um, we get a different basis. But once we choose um, one of these reduced expressions, then it's consistent and it gives us a PBW type theorem. So to prove it, um, we're going to define for any. Uh, w and W, the subspace U plus W spanned by the expressions T alpha one through T alpha R minus one of E alpha R to some power. monomials like this, where w itself is playing the role of the w not above. So in other words, s alpha 1 through s alpha r 
is a reduced expression for W. So for each W, we can just define this subspace. It's the subspace spanned by all these monomials. So. And maybe just a comment. So when Q is equal to one, this is going to be uh, the universal enveloping of a set on subalgebra in N plus. Namely the subalgebra, which corresponds to roots. Uh, let's see which uh, to positive roots alpha such that W sends uh, alpha to a negative root. Yeah, this clearly defines for you a subalgebra because this is closed under addition. Gotcha. So, first, um, we need to know that this is well defined. So, we need to know that. this u plus w, as we just defined, doesn't change when we pick a different reduced expression. And b is that when alpha is not equal to beta and they're simple roots, And if W is the longest element in the subgroup generated by S alpha S beta, then U plus W spans the subalgebra of U generated by E alpha E beta. What do you mean spans? Coincides with? Yeah, sorry. Is the sum out. Okay, so. Um, and Kavli, you have like uh, five minutes. So. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of stopping here because this is sort of a longer proof. Okay. Uh, let's thank uh, Kalda for the talk. Uh, do people have questions? I, I have a question from the big, from the first lectures. We did, we proved this tensor product decomposition of U in terms of U minus U zero and U plus. So do we know at the moment that we know at the moment that U plus has the right graded dimension to have such a spanning set or is that not true? I think we don't. Okay. Right, because uh, so what can happen, you, you can think about it this way. So uh, you deform the relations and actually for just u plus, it's very easy because you don't have this weird multiplicative part. So you just take the relations of u of n plus and you pick some deformation of these relations. And generally speaking, when you do so, the size drops, right? Um, so my internet connection just went out. I'm sure that you had a really good answer, but. Uh, okay, uh, so, so uh, okay, so what, what we've done uh, to get u plus out of u of n plus is that we have deformed the defining relations, right? And generally, when we do so, uh, the size of algebra drops. Mm -hmm. So we know that when q is uh, uh, transcendental, then we get dimensions which are less or equal uh, with the dimensions that we've started with. And that's the only thing that we know. We don't know anything else. 
And in fact, what is going here works when uh, Q is not a root of unity, although I think in the proof, occasionally we used facts which were only established for transcendental Q. Which nevertheless are true uh, outside of root of unity as well. It's true for the usual U, not the Lustig U. Yeah, so this is all for the usual uh, U, and uh, I think next time, well, I mean, at least in the next um, couple of talks, Dave will explain uh, some things that have to do with Lustig's form. Uh, more questions, please. So, Pasha, I think it's our oversight that we haven't developed a system of awarding mushrooms for questions. <laughs> well, we really be more systematic, you know. We can award uh, mushrooms for answers. Uh, and uh, if your answer is correct, one kind of mushrooms, and uh, for wrong answer, another kind. Right, so if you give a wrong answer, it will give you a mushroom which uh, widens the horizons and uh, things improves like that. your imagination. That's right. So, any other questions? <laughs> 